And of course, what you see uh, is some variable amount of uh, branding. Uh, and what uh, it has suggested to a, a series of experiments like this is that they like to work with soils of certain moisture conditions. Uh, and that what they do is they actually uh, bring in the soil. They work with it. And then they put it out. And that soil has about 18% moisture. So we wanted to see this process in action. Uh, so we did some, we used something called fluorescein acid. It's a pretty cheap chemical, uh, but it glows in UV. So what we did was then put the, bring the termite mounds to the lab, have two patches. One's a dry soil patch, other's a wet soil patch, which is uh, mixed with water, mixed with fluorescein. And um, you can see what happens. I should mention that this observation and question was prompted by the work of a high school student uh, in the lab uh, who was brave enough to try and put a boroscope, uh, uh, endoscopic camera down the uh, mouth. And he saw a lot of termites with swollen belly. And he wondered if they were transporting water. And that's what led to these experiments. So you can see that there's a lot of termites actually just ingesting the water. And in certain cases, you see also uh, some intimate movements. So here's a termite with uh, water. It's communicating with this other termite. This is a behavior also seen in ants, where they exchange water. So we feel that they might be um, transporting water from one uh, side to the other. And this is work ongoing. Um, but we, we feel that this is a very important line to follow. And uh, we are looking at how they modulate moisture levels. And could this give us a clue about how they are able to build mounds um, in heavy rains uh, in Agumbe, for instance, uh, in northern Karnataka, which receives tremendous amounts of uh, versus Bangalore, in which you have a lot of rain and then uh, a long period of dry dryness. Just in the last little bit, uh, running out of time, I want to talk a little bit about uh, traffic rules in termites. I mentioned very briefly that you don't see traffic jams in termites. How does this work? And so that has prompted a series of experiments uh, by Sri Krishna Raja Verma. And this is the nature of the experiments. What we do is we take a bunch of termites, put them in a plastic uh, box, and wait. And they go from chaos to order pretty rapidly. And what we can then do is take videos like this and track individual termites. So that, that red mark is uh, a single termite uh, as it goes from uh, chaos to order. We can see 10 or 15 of the termites and you know, get uh, some sense of how they are moving. And then measure, measure the angular velocities or uh, whatever parameter we want. So we wanted to ask, is this behavior density dependent? And the reason we ask that question is we know that single cockroaches uh, like to follow walls. They like to follow walls because their antennae brush against the wall and they're working in dark, so they are effectively uh, without eyes. Um, so it, it may be that if they were to just continue doing this in a circular arena, they would just go round and round and you might see uh, milling behavior. And that's what you're seeing in, in termite. But that's, so that's uh, a cockroach. Uh, you can see that the antenna is brushing against the wall. And, uh, this has been a very well studied behavior. So we've done experiments like that. That's the base of the antenna. There's a single termite. But we don't seem to see much of this sort of milling behavior in single termites. They seem to uh, operate fairly erratically. So we felt maybe uh, this, this is something that is density dependent. And so that's the experiment here. There's a bunch of termites moving erratically. Now we add more termites. And 
and they start spinning. And this behavior is very much density dependent. So if the density is low, uh, the time for milling is much longer. But if the density is high, they very quickly uh, begin milling. And their time of the speeds of their transport dramatic. So the question then was, how are they doing this milling? And so what we did was we uh, tested if this was chemically mediated. So here's a bunch of termites. In this time, we can actually remove the walls, and they disperse. Okay? But if you take a set of termites that have already been milling, watch what happens. And we can ask questions like, how long will they continue milling? What is the half-life of this, and so on? And this just continues for a long time. And uh, we, we then thought, uh, this must be mediated through chemicals. So here's an experiment that tries to test that idea. So we have a, a floor that you, you remove. Uh, and we'll see if you then disrupt this chemical trail, what happens. And that disrupts the behavior. So it's very much uh, chemically mediated. In fact, the chemical that one species lays down is sufficient cue for another species. And that's an experiment uh, shown here. So this is uh, one um, um, species. The odontoderm is red and honey. And then what we do is we take them out, empty the jar, put it back, and then put uh, termites of another species there. And so you can see like the milling start. So this is just sort of uh, experiments that are ongoing. There's many different directions we can take. We can go towards theory. We can go towards experiments, chemicals, all sorts of um, but the broad conclusions one can draw from this is that uh, they're using a combination of mechanosensory treatment. Maybe the initial onset happens because of mechanosensors, and then chemicals take over. Uh, they lay down these chemicals to these glands in their base of their uh, bodies, or external glands, and then they establish a trail which they might follow. It is density dependent, uh, it reduces time of transport, and chemical fuels are not species. And the broader functions that, uh, broader questions that we are asking have to do more with the mount function, where is the sense located, and these are things that we need to be pursuing uh, in the coming future. How are these mediated? How do termites modulate? Soil moisture. So I just want to end with one thought. This is just on a slightly philosophical note. This is Socrates, and there's a wonderful story about it. Uh, in one of the dialogues where they talk about how a student of Socrates went to um, the Oracle of Delphi and asked the Oracle of Delphi a very important question. He asked, is Socrates the wisest man on the planet? And the Oracle so sensed what the answer should be and said, yeah, he's the wisest man on the planet. So the student goes back to Socrates and says, I have it from the Oracle of Delphi that you are the wisest man on the planet. And Socrates was incredulous. He said, how, how can this possibly be? I, I don't know anything. And that's the Socrates paradox. So Socrates then goes out, and in dialogue after dialogue, uh, written by Plato, actually, uh, Socrates is a character that's going out looking for people smarter than and trying to question them about things that they're supposed to be smarter, and then finding out towards half of the dialogue that they know nothing. And then from there, sort of building back uh, an edifice, uh, be it a republic or some idea um, that uh, he cares about in that particular dialogue. But the, the sort of idea that Socrates gives us, the story gives us, is that wisdom is about not knowing. Everything that you find out leads to more questions. And that's the most wonderful thing about science, is that 
you don't know to ask a question unless you've made a finding. And then once you made the finding, then suddenly there are 10 questions that didn't exist before. And now you're pursuing all of them. And that's sort of the process in which we've gotten um, involved in. I should say we're milling in it. Um, I should end with uh, thanks to these two students. This is Sri Krishna Verma Raja, Amritan, both students of physics. Um, from a campus not very far from here, the Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences. Uh, and uh, a lot of students who helped him out, uh, and, and the Human Frontier Science Program, which funded much of this, is a funding agency that just loves uh, random science like this. So thank you very much. Oh, in the water. Oh, in the water. Yeah. So okay. what you call in the water. Okay. And then what kind of fluorescence? It's a fluorescein. It's a chemical okay. that you can buy. So it's in the water. Yeah. How long does it live, each termite? Each termite. I mean, the workers and the uh, allies, uh, the workers and the soldiers don't live very long. Uh, I'm not sure how long, but on the order of months. But the queen can live for decades. And in fact, in ants, um, the queens can live for decades. They also build these nests. But they mate only once. So here's a question. You know, how can they store that sperm for 20 years? question. But yeah, they can live for a pretty long time. And the mouse can last. And some mouse will last for seconds. Uh, animals. 
you have individuals that do the same thing over and over again, but different. Uh, there is a division of labor. In certain termites will handle only certain kind of building, and certain others will only do some other. Kind. So you, you see that that part. Something that is nice and functional when it's used, but goes back to the ground, uh, you know, as soon as you're done with it. It doesn't leave ruins out there. Or uh, you could, you know, you could use this for many other, there are people who are making robots, or swarm robots, using uh, the kinds of information that they generate. So it's really, uh, there's, there's no limit to what you can, use this knowledge for, but that's up to you. So our job is to <coughs> figure out what's going on. structure, make sure that they reinforce the chemical. <laughs> Not always. No. It, it needs a reason to do that. Uh, there's just one more question and come observation. You know, you've got these flutes out there. Uh, and if you look at the bend of what was shown as wind movement and that, but these flutes wouldn't they impede in the movement of wind? Additionally, uh, do these flutes have any other purpose? And that's what we're trying to find out. They could be like radiators in the car. You need, need increased surface area to radiate heat. <coughs> so if it's hotter inside, it needs to cool down and you know, just to equilibrate themselves with the ambient air. That's one possibility. The other is what you mentioned, create stagnation points uh, for, as the fluid flows over uh, these structures so that you have a large pressure and that those pressure differences can then cause internal ventilation. Uh, Race spinning capacity is considered as an innate capacity of the species. Mm -hmm. In termites and cockroaches, they are quite similar to each other. Uh -huh. Is the genome of the two differs at a very major level? Because one species can build this and the other can't. Yes, actually their genomes are different enough in critical ways. So it's not so much the broad difference between the genomes. The, the sequence similarities may be great, but in very critical uh, genes, they are different. And this is true not just for termites. I mean, we might say that they are similar and that they are cockroaches because they form one plate within the cockroach group. But they're still, you know, they still have a history of something like, I don't know, on the order of tens of millions of years uh, of separation. Okay, what's their difference? Essentially guided by the phenotypic uh, modulations or by environmental? Uh, both, but uh, I mean, eventually it's encoded in the genes. Uh, so a termite behaves as a social animal. Cockroaches don't. And there's certain cockroaches that are sort of social but not real. Likewise, in um, Hamenoptera, so in, in the case of uh, 
bees and wasps, there are solitary wasps and there are social. And in some cases, you have these transients where you can turn a solitary wasp into a social wasp. So you see those transitions as well. Um, a lot of it is chemically mediated. You can you know, activate certain pheromones that cause uh, the wasps to become social. Uh, it, you know, you can activate this. We don't understand how this works in termites or cockroaches, but um, it's somewhere there in their genome. And you know, we see a large number of uh, hymenoptera that are social. For instance, ants are social, wasps are social, <laughs> bees are social. They're all part of the same group. Uh, but this is the only example uh, in the group that consists of cockroaches that uh, is social. So, you know, it is there somewhere in the genome. Uh, it can be activated or not. Maybe it cannot be activated in cockroaches because it lacks in just those crucial genes. Uh, we don't quite know. Last two questions. Uh, sir, this is more of a suggestion. Uh, have you tried using swarm robotics? Uh, you know, uh, the robots of the shape of the termites and, you know, ingesting them in the molds uh, and later on you can receive information how they work and so. Not me, but uh, someone called Radhika Nathpal is doing that and she's at Harvard. Uh, my plate is full with this. Uh, so what we will do is, you know, inform them about what we find and they can take that for them. Do the termites always mean clockwise? Mm, that's an interesting question. Do they always mean clockwise? Uh, no, they don't. And sometimes in all the films I showed you, they were milling clockwise, but that's not how they are. Okay, I'm sure there are many more questions, but uh, perhaps they can be taken up to the